Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute's webinar series, Cancer Immunotherapy and You. Today's date is Wednesday, December 14th, 2016, and the title for today's webinar is Progress of Immunotherapy in Childhood Cancers. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. This webinar series is made possible with generous support from Genentech and LabAnswer and its employees, along with additional support from AbbVie, Celdex Therapeutics, New Link Genetics, and Regeneron. My name is Brian Brewer, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving more lives through research that aims to harness the immune system's power to conquer all cancers. We fund scientists around the world whose work has led to significant breakthroughs in cancer immunotherapy research and treatment. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll hear from an immunotherapy expert about how treatment of childhood cancers is undergoing a revolution thanks to these breakthroughs, followed by a question and answer period. You can ask your, you can ask your questions at any time during the webinar by typing in the Q&A box on your screen, and we hope to get to as many of your questions as possible in the time that we have. We are recording today's webinar, and we'll make it available via our website at cancerresearch.org and also on our YouTube channel. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's expert speaker. Dr. Alex Wong is the Clinical Fellowship Director at Case Western Reserve University's UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. We're also very proud of the fact that he's a former Cancer Research Institute postdoctoral fellow and investigator. Dr. Wong's work focuses on children's cancer and improving our ability to monitor cancer development and how cancer influences the activity of immune cells within the tumor microenvironment. The goal of this work is to develop immunotherapy treatments that lead to improved outcomes for childhood cancer patients. Dr. Huang, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Thank you, Brian, and thanks for everybody for joining this uh, webinar. Um, just before I start, uh, just a disclosure slide that I have no financial relationships to disclose and I will not discuss any off-label use or investigational use in my presentation. Um, as a, a way of a quick introduction, um, my name is Alex Huang. I'm Associate Professor of Pathology and Pediatrics and Biomedical Engineering at uh, Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm also a, um, a clinical faculty at the University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital uh, and the Angie Fowler AYA Cancer Institute um, at the Cancer Center at the uh, uh, Comprehensive, Case, Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm also a co-leader of the hematopoiesis and uh, immune cell biology program leader, as well as the uh, tumor immunology and immunotherapy focus group leader. Um, and I am a, a director of the pediatric uh, hematology oncology fellowship training program at Rainbow. So what I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so to talk to everyone about is some updates on some of the exciting uh, developments in using immunotherapy to fight childhood cancer. And in childhood cancer, I also include um, adolescent and young adult cancers, cancers that happens in the second and third decades of life. Um, and I will, um, as I go through, I'll discuss in both populations as well. What, how big of a problem is childhood and adolescent young adult cancer? Well, it turns out that among uh, the lead, major leading causes of death for children, adolescent and young adults uh, between the age of 1 to 14 in one category on the left column, and uh, adolescents uh, between 15 to 19 on the middle column and combined together on the right column, childhood cancer actually constitutes the number one major causes of medical causes of, of death in this population behind accidental unintentional injuries uh, or uh, intentional suicides and homicides. So it constitutes a major problem uh, in this particular vulnerable population. Uh, taken together, the cases are roughly around 15,000 cases of childhood and adolescent young adult cancers in the United States per year. Um, and cumulatively, if you were to include patients that are found in the third decade, meaning in the 20s, the number of cases goes up to 70,000 cases roughly a year. And um, we over, over the past five decades or so, 
we've actually done remarkably well as a community of physician and physician scientists to improve the outcome of children and adolescent young adults afflicted with cancer. So the graph here on the left hand side shows that um, depending on the disease um, population here, for example, leukemia in the 1960s, less than 5% of patients diagnosed with leukemia survive or uh, survive over five years. And now depending on the particular subtype of leukemia, this improved uh, to a almost uh, over 90% survival. And you can see the red bars across the board has shown remarkable improvement. So overall survival for childhood cancer is roughly 80%. Um, and this shows on the bottom right hand side the progressive improvement in the overall survival of these patients uh, at this age group. Now these uh, particular advances obviously are very impressive and they came from uh, as a result of multi-investigational, multi-center cooperative trials that pediatric oncologists have learned long, long ago uh, to do together to improve the outcome so that if you have a child who's diagnosed in one region of the country, you will be treated exactly on the same protocol as another child who's, uh, who's diagnosed on the other side of the country. And so we have done uh, as a community of pediatric oncologists a remarkable job at, at uh, collaborating with each other and through intensification and, and combination of chemotherapeutics, radiation and surgery, have improved the overall outcome. However, these outcomes actually came at a price. And the price that we pay is that survivors of childhood cancer um, uh, carry a uh, long-term morbidity and mortality that is more than the general population of their peers. And this is due to the fact that chemotherapeutics affects uh, the uh, young and growing child, um, as well as uh, surgery and radiation to a point where that uh, the patients who survive the cancer, the first cancer, sometimes come back with a second cancer, uh, or the therapeutic modalities we inflicted on them causes uh, long-term side effects such as uh, cardiac toxicities and renal toxicities, et cetera. And so there's still significant problems associated with uh, the improved outcome, and this is as a whole, uh, community as a whole is something that uh, the challenges us. The second challenge also is despite all the successes we have, we actually are still not doing very well when it comes to solid tumors, for example, refractory metastatic disease. Uh, that as a, as a population, these patients tend not to do as well. Sometimes the survivals are still less than 50%. So these are still unacceptable numbers. And uh, recently, obviously, with the immunotherapy being the, uh, the very exciting area of development in all cancer therapy uh, space, is now beginning to um, the trickle down to childhood cancer and adolescent young adults. Now, obviously, um, the immunotherapy promise is that through the use of our immune system, which is highly sensitive and specific and is able to traffic to various parts of your body where potentially drugs uh, or the surgeon's hands cannot reach, it has the promise of effectively removing cancer cells if you were able to control such a uh, uh, these uh, immuno, uh, immune systems to, to do so. And also, the other advantage is the immune system can be exploited to attack the uh, cancer cells ultimately with a promise of memory. Um, and that's one of the functions, that's the reason why we immunize our children ourselves against a variety of infectious agents. So there's holds a lot of promise now uh, in using immunotherapy to treat childhood cancer. Um, in, in that when we are uh, successful in, in uh, curing a child of a childhood cancer, this uh, patient faces a lifelong, um, another five, seven, eight decades of life, and we want to make sure that whatever uh, therapy we provide them uh, will not put them at uh, a higher risk for developing subsequent problems, and uh, hopefully uh, immunotherapy is one of such approach that will provide uh, this uh, promise. Now, in terms of immunotherapy in childhood cancer, actually, we, you know, we, uh, I think many of us are familiar with uh, bone marrow transplantation in the cases of where we need to provide a large doses of chemotherapeutics to a patient to the point where the normal hematopoietic stem cells uh, will succumb to the toxicity of the drug that we provide. 
In that case, we actually replace or rescue the patient with a bone marrow harvested either through the patient uh, him or herself before giving the chemotherapeutics, or we uh, get it from another donor, whether related or unrelated bone marrow donor, and rescue the patient with a transplant of the hematopoietic stem cells. Now, this is actually the oldest form of immunotherapy uh, that is commonly used. Um, when successful, the, some of the immune cells that comes in the donor's graft can actually react against the recipient tumor cells in a process called graft-versus-leukemia effect. Now, as uh, many patients uh, they are undergoing bone marrow transplant know that this comes with a price. The price is that the same T cells or the immune cells can react against normal tissues in the recipient causes graft-versus-host disease. But in principle, this uh, GVL effect of from a bone marrow transplant is one form of immunotherapy. And I just want to mention it here so before we uh, get further into our discussion. Now, in general, I want to uh, basically uh, summarize our current strategy in the immune system to fight childhood cancer or cancer in, in adults, for that matter. Um, and hopefully, this will provide everyone a framework to think about different mechanisms or approaches we can use to fight cancer. The first strategy and that's been talked about in this webinar and, and, and other presentations before, is the, to isolate and manipulate immune cells that we harvested from, uh, from the patient's body and, and then manipulate them outside of the body in a tissue incubator uh, in the laboratory and then ultimately infuse them back. So in this case, what we have is either isolating immune cells from the peripheral blood sometimes from draining lymph nodes where all the immune cells live, or sometimes within a tumor itself, and use a, a variety of approaches to isolate individual immune cells, such as T cells, and to expand them to a large quantity of numbers, and hopefully in doing so, also uh, upregulate or to increase their ability to kill the tumor cells, and ultimately we infuse them back into patients and hoping the same immune cells will traffic to where the tumors are hiding and be able to kill them in, uh, inside the body of the patient. Now, more recently, the exciting thing uh, that has developed over the last five, seven years is our ability to manipulate using genetic transfer uh, techniques a variety of different targets that we can put into the cells that we grow in the culture dish so that all the T cells that grew up under these conditions express specific uh, homing mechanisms and recognition molecules, they will all recognize the same tumor target um, so that we make them more homogeneous and, a, um, and they can act in concert to then eradicate the tumor cells that expresses the target that they recognize. Now, this kind of approach has been uh, expanded outside of the NK uh, T cells and more recently using another type of immune cells called the natural killer cells, which has a different recognition uh, mechanism than the T cells, but they too can be manipulated inside the dish of a laboratory to a large number or can be genetically ma uh, manipulated to, uh, to express the same type or different types of surface receptors to recognize the same target on the tumor cells. They can then be given back to the patients and, uh, and hopefully in some cases have remarkable responses against, for example, leukemia. And uh, this, I don't, I'm not going to draw, draw too long on this topic, but this uh, chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell concept was first demonstrated uh, by uh, Dr. Carl June at Penn, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, the first patient receiving the CAR T cell therapy is uh, Emma, who has failed multiple uh, relapses of leukemia. And uh, with the CAR T cell, she was able to be uh, as of present time, uh, no evidence of disease. So this had continues to improve uh, and extend, expand beyond the uh, initial trials, and they are now uh, encouraging results from ongoing CAR T cell trials against uh, B cell leukemia that recognize or express a antigen called CD19. And there are a variety of ongoing clinical trials that are going uh, in this space. There are additional uh, genetic modifications beyond CD19 CAR T cells, such as CD22 CAR T cells, that has now uh, gone into clinical trials. And, um, and the combination of both CD19 and CD22 are also going into clinical trials to make sure that there's no escape 
uh, by tumors to downregulate one of these targets, thereby making the CAR T cell ineffective. There are other potential targets now that are being developed, such as a HER2 um, uh, recognition CAR T cell. Uh, the molecule HER2 is not only expressed, uh, maybe you've heard about it in a breast cancer field, but it turns out that some of the sarcomas in pediatrics, such as uh, osteosarcoma, can also express the same target on the surface of the tumor, and potentially a CAR T cell that recognizes this particular antigen, the, the HER2, can be used to treat uh, sarcomas. And there's an ongoing clinical trial uh, with that. And any of the trials that we mentioned here, you can actually look it up uh, through the uh, Cancer Research Institute's uh, uh, database and, and clinical uh, trial database. Now, the challenge of using adaptive T cell NK cell therapy is that um, they are uh, they work pretty well with malignancies like leukemia that has a well defined target, um, but it uh, relies on a couple things. One is the availability of the patient's own T cells to manipulate in the uh, culture dish. Now, that doesn't always happen. Uh, you have patients that come in. When they relapse or they're heavily treated, they may not have suitable T cells for the, the physicians to manipulate in the culture. Sometimes there are the lack of suitable targets beyond uh, the, the uh, CD19 or 22 T cells that uh, serves as a good target for uh, manipulating uh, these T cells. And also, because these are technically very difficult to do potentially, they are limited to uh, the accessibility for patients and their family to receive this therapy uh, only in selected institutions with the, required, with the required capability. So there are some limitations to this very exciting field of uh, doctor T cell therapy, and uh, we stay tuned to see what the outcomes are with these ongoing clinical trials. The second strategy is uh, similar to the first strategy to activate the immune system, with the exception that rather than using a culture dish to activate the immune system, we use a variety of, of vaccine strategies, such as whole cell tumors themselves or other parts of the immune system, like the professional antigen presenting cells that we can culture in the dish, or DNA vaccines or even nanoparticles more recently, to then immunize the patients with a cancer um, and use the patient's own body as an incubator to hopefully, in that regard, activate the immune cells through these variety of vaccine strategies to expand and acquire their killing function and ultimately kill the tumor cells. Um, and some of these examples can be found, uh, again, these are ongoing clinical trials, for example, oncolytic viral vaccines that uh, creates an environment in the tumor where uh, the, the, the virus itself causes an activation of the immune system and in that process sets up an, an environment in which the anti-tumor immunity can be activated and kill, for example, brain tumors. There are other cells such as uh, dendritic cells that can be used as vaccines and there are ongoing trials in the brain tumor uh, arena in the childhood cancer uh, against malignant glioma and glioblastoma and other diseases such as diffuse pontine glioma and other gliomas that uh, now uh, efforts are also being used to use peptides that are derived from these tumors to immunize patients so that the T cells can recognize peptides expressed on the surface of these tumor cells. The third strategy is one that actually exists for a long time now, um, and that is to identify target proteins on the surface of cancer cells that is not present in normal cells. And so one example of this is in a very common pediatric solid tumor called neuroblastoma. The neuroblastoma tumor cells, it commonly expresses uh, GD2 ant uh, antigen on the surface that is normally absent in other normal tissues. And so uh, we can develop antibodies that specifically recognize these uh, tumor-associated antigens. And these antibodies can be administered to patients. And through a variety of different uh, mechanisms, these antibodies will attack the, immune, uh, the tumor cells and target them for destruction by the, the body's immune system. And the example of that, as I mentioned already, is the most recently approved uh, antibody therapy by the FDA, uh, the humanized uh, 14 anti antibody for neuroblastoma. There are other ongoing trials now using a variety of different protein targets on tumor cells, such as CD30, in the case of Hodgkin's lymphoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. 
Um, and also, some of the antibodies can be used to target directly not just at, at uh, surface molecules, but actually growth factors and other receptors, uh, and such as uh, TB403 here in refractory medulloblastoma and other, uh, and, and other gliomas. So lastly, uh, the more uh, recent development, and this is one that has generated a lot of excitement, uh, in uh, cancer immunotherapy is the concept of uh, blocking the immune checkpoint. And I think uh, for this audience, perhaps, I don't need to go through a lot of the background information. Need, needless to say that we have found the um, it, normally what happens when the immune system is trying to exert itself to kill uh, the cancer cells. Cancer cells has found a way to put a brake in this uh, fast-moving car so that the, the uh, immune cells cannot function properly. And what we have found was being the ability to actually relieve that break um, in, such a, in such a fashion that the immune cells can continuously kill uh, and become activated and, and, and target the tumor cells. So it turns out that as immune cells come and fight cancer cells, cancer cells fight back and, uh, and, and basically put up a defense shield, uh, the immune checkpoint, um, and that renders the immune cells uh, incapable of uh, exerting its uh, function. This is very similar to, uh, for those of you who are waiting for Rogue One to be released tomorrow night, um, in every Death Star there is a shield that the, uh, that the Empire generated so that the, the resistance cannot uh, go in and attack it. So to make this Death Star vulnerable, you have to deactivate the shield such that the whole Death Star can be blown up, even with one single missile. So that's the concept of immune, immune checkpoint. And again, to reiterate here, is that the, normally the immune cells um, are able to uh, recognize the tumor, tumors via tumor antigen, but because of this immune checkpoint expressed by tumor cells engages on the T cells, that renders the T cells ineffective. Uh, however, if you uh, were to block this interaction, you will make this T cell effective to in killing the tumor cells. So, Currently, uh, some of these antibodies have already been approved by the FDA to use in some indications in adults, and they are now starting to move into the pediatric space. Uh, for example, anti-PD-1 antibodies now uh, through the Children's Oncology Group has uh, ongoing trial in pediatric solid tumors. Uh, the anti-PD-L1 antibody um, that can, is also now open uh, with, uh, with clinical trials to target adolescent young adult patients and pediatric with solid tumor. And there are other uh, similar trials going on in solid tumor space as well. So it's very exciting to see how it's going to turn out. Um, now, the last few minutes, what I want to say, uh, say about you know, our ongoing effort is that there's been considerable debate about whether uh, immune checkpoint or other immunotherapeutics can be successful in ch uh, childhood and adolescent cancer. And the concern was that as yes, we have seen in, in immune checkpoint uh, in adults, that not every patient responds to the immune checkpoint blockade. And the ones that respond tend to, at least from the global perspective, be the tumor cells that have very high mutational load, um, such as melanoma and small cell lung cancer, etc. Now, if you were to look at where pediatric and adolescent young adult cancers lie, these, pa these um, tumors tend to be those that have very low mutational burden meaning that potentially the neoantigen or the, the, the new recognized peptides or proteins produced by the tumor cells that's different than normal cells potentially might be fewer in number. And there are other studies such as uh, looking at all the tissue, uh, uh, biopsy tissues, seeing that among pediatric cancer types, there are actually very few expressions of some of these immune checkpoint molecules like PD-1 and pd one and raising the, op the, the question whether anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 blocking antibody will actually work. So, you know, we remain to, it remains to be seen how the outcome of these ongoing trials will work. Um, and there, the last point I want to raise was that one of the other uh, debate about immune checkpoint is that we see a lot of toxicity profiles, and some of these pretty lethal. And so, you know, can we find a different way that will bypass some of the, uh, the, the mechanisms that causes the adverse effects. And I mentioned earlier about this sort of the whole Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, analogy of the shield that the, the tumor cells put up to resist immune checkpoint. 
can we make, is there a way, rather than using antibody to block when the shield appear, can we make this defense shield disappear from within the tumor cell so that only the tumor cells will, put, will downregulate this defense shield and the normal tissue that needs the defense shield to, to uh, evade autoimmunity can actually keep this defense shield. So recently, we have published a, a study looking at medulloblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma in mouse and also as well as in human cell lines show that we have identified a new target uh, like C, uh, such as CDK5 which is highly expressed in a variety of tumor cells. But what we found was that this molecule actually can control the level of PDL1 or these immune shield expressions on medulloblastoma, at least in a mouse model. And so what it does now is give us a new target to go after, um, the inhibitor for CDK5, for example, um, whereby we can actually target a molecule that's highly expressed in tumors and uh, less so in normal tissue. And by targeting that, we can actually modulate the amount of the, the immune checkpoint molecule expressions on the tumor and make them uh, susceptible to immune checkpoint. What's exciting is that in medulloblastoma tissue samples from clinical samples, we found that as the higher expression of CDK5 in tumors, actually the lower the number of T cell infiltration. So suggesting that if you were to lower the number level of CDK5 expression, potentially we can enhance the immune infiltration into and making the tumors more susceptible to immune attack. So these are ongoing trials, uh, ongoing uh, investigations we have in the laboratory, and we're very excited to see where you will lead us. So there's a new paradigm um, that we've seen in a traditional blockade of immune checkpoint that, uh, that the side effect will be severe autoimmunity, um, but if you were to be able to now specifically target tumors such that they downregulate the expression of the actual molecule rather than relying on the, uh, the, the blocking antibody that potentially can target a specific downregulation of the immune checkpoint in the tumor and, and potentially not affecting the normal tissue. So in summary, the, there's major strides being achieved in pediatric cancer over several decades. Uh, but as I mentioned, the major challenges remain. Uh, both in survivorship as well as in uh, unintended consequences of our very intensive therapy. Um, the immunotherapy offers an important and, and I think effective alternative. Um, the CAR T cell approach, antibody therapy, hematopoietic stem cell transplantations have been proven successful. And uh, just as a note, the CAR T cell again has been developed first in pediatrics, um, but then the immune checkpoint, the molecules has been developed in adults. And that's why we're seeing the, the, the application of immune checkpoint blockade later in a pediatric space, but hopefully we'll now catch up to the adult's experience. Um, there are oncolytic viruses and other approaches that are being tested all together trying to improve the activation of the immune system and use the immune system to fight cancer. So I'll end my presentation there and I'll be happy to ask uh, to take any questions. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Wong, for that. Um, I'd like to remind everyone who's watching that um, there is a Q&A box on your screen. If you have a question for Dr. Wong, now would be the time to type that in, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, I think before we get into the questions, one thing that's important to point out is that many of the immunotherapies that you described have been approved by the FDA for treatment of adults um, and that as far as I know none of them has yet been approved for treatment of children and in fact any of the immunotherapies that you discussed um, they're only available in clinical trials at this stage um, but it is important to point out that uh, many of these have been demonstrated to be effective in treating adults with various types of cancer and um, I think you raise a lot of very interesting points about the differences between tumors in children and those in adults, particularly uh, that low mutational burden, which may make those tumors less susceptible to treatment with immunotherapy, and then um, the absence of the checkpoints. So um, very interesting for you to show us how um, there are strategies uh, underway with the CDK5 to see what we can do to, uh, I guess, upregulate that PDL one and, and make those tumors susceptible to checkpoint inhibition, uh, checkpoint blockade. So um, with that um, said, let's get to some of these questions. Um, so the CDK5, you, you said, was a way to kind of get that PDL one back in play. Um, is there anything being done to increase 
mutational load in general um, about these cancers. What other, what other strategies, if any, are there um, in clinic right now or even in the laboratory stage that are designed to make these cancers more susceptible to the immune system? Yeah, so it, it, it turns out that um, the, the variety of different peptides or different antigens that tumors can express is not solely a reflection of the mutational load. So the mutation alone is one aspect of, of how tumors control the diversity of antigens they can recognize. But it turns out there is actually a lot of epigenetic regulations, for example. You know, you can have genes and mutations that's present in the genome, but without the chromatin being open, these, these genes are not transcribed and translated into proteins. So they, and it turns out there's a lot of epigenetic regulations that controls which genes got turned on and which genes got turned off. And there are actually ongoing trials um, and, and some laboratory studies that I'm aware of that are trying to take advantage of that and use epigenetic regulation uh, approaches to see whether or not when you open a chromatin in a tumor using these drugs, can you now make the tumors express more antigens than they otherwise would have done, and thereby making them more susceptible to immune, you know, the immune attack. So they are going, and I think that some of the hurdles are that some of these drugs that, that regulate the epigenetic uh, landscape are uh, they're, they're terrible uh, in vivo sort of pharmacokinetic uh, properties that makes them very uh, not, not as user friendly, and some toxicities remain. So they are now, uh, I'm aware, uh, there, there are some strategies now trying to circumvent these problems, and, uh, and you know, in some cases they have gone through adult phase one trials and actually uh, these I know in Cleveland Clinic, they are trying to discuss whether we can actually bring this to the pediatric uh, population as well. So since most of these immunotherapies, or all of them uh, currently, are available only through clinical trial, um, at what point does a parent or a parents decide uh, that it's appropriate to enroll his or her child or their child in an immunotherapy clinical trial? And who are the, the people on the, the medical team that the parents are dealing with um, that advises them on this? How does that work? Yeah, so um, as pediatric oncologists, you know, we're very paternalistic when it comes to uh, dealing with our patients. Um, you know, we, we, we treasure our relationship with our patient and, and families. And obviously, any decision-making process that occurs is through a very thorough discussion, a fair presentation of available um, resources and available protocols and what are the current sort of cutting edge results. And through those discussions with your own private, uh, with your own physician, um, we come to a conclusion on what's the best for this child. Now, uh, a little bit, uh, there's a second level to that, and that is that uh, at least in our uh, institution, every child that's diagnosed with cancer, the treatment plan has not only been approved by the physician, the primary physician taking care of the child, but every case is presented through a tumor board in discussion with the rest of the faculty at the institution so that we, we have a sort of a round table night approach to, to, the, to the therapeutic decisions. So a lot of that decisions happen, um, yes, behind, you know, closed door in, in, the, um, in the patient's room discussing with the physicians um, but, uh, but there's also a, a cast of characters that are, that are engaged in those decision-making process. Now, in terms of when to invoke immunotherapy, I think this will prove to be a, one of the areas that we need to spend some time discussing as a, as a group. Because as I said earlier in my slides, we have done actually remarkably well with, with chemotherapeutics, right, for leukemia. And it's hard to argue if you already have a 95% success rate, to to then uh, potentially abandon those those approach, and then and then try in an unproven clinical trial at the first diagnosis. So so all, most often uh, the patients they will be funneled through immunotherapeutic trials are the ones that have failed the upfront standard therapy, uh, even you know maybe a second line therapy um, before we invoke immunotherapy. Now I'm hoping as we move forward as a field and our, our confidence and, and the data is showing that this will work better uh, either up front uh, in treating the patient right up front or preventing second re relapse or malignancy or have a long-term uh, survival and protection benefit 
I think these eventually will have to move into um, some of these ongoing clinical trials to have a head-to-head -head comparison. But I think that's one of the areas I think will be a very uh, um, potentially contentious issue in pediatric uh, cancer, just because, um, like I said, we, we have done pretty well in, in many diseases. But as I mentioned, that those successes came with a hefty price in, in many cases. And, uh, and you know, if you're able to demonstrate the efficacy of immunotherapy being equal, if not superior, to ongoing standard of care with very less, less side effects, then, you know, we can start to make the, the, you know, the decision to move it forward. But this will all be done uh, collectively as a, as a, uh, as a group um, with, uh, with all the investigators in, in this field. So. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, it's the if it ain't broke, don't fix it model. That, that, yeah. And sometimes that's good, but sometimes, um, you know, I, I, like, like I said, you know, you, it's, easier, it's easy for it to say that we have 95% cure rate. But uh, if you're the parent of a child who falls in that 5%, even if it's 99% cure rate, if your child happened to be that 1%, you will, you will go to the moon and back to do anything for your child. And, and I, you know, we need to make immunotherapy a, a, um, an op, a realistic option um, for those pa patients and families faced with this difficult problem. You mentioned that, um, you know, the, the hope or the eventuality may be that immunotherapies perform better than conventional therapies and they'll de therefore become first-line therapies. And we have seen that happen in some adult tumors, a melanoma and lung cancer. Uh, with frontline approvals of immunotherapy, so um, v very interesting yeah. that you raise that point. Well, the, the other thing is, for example, I mentioned about the neuroblastoma antibody, uh, the the humanized 1418 antibody. Uh, there is now, a, you know, in some of the uh, children's oncology clinical trials, the use of that antibody has now moved forward to, in combination with the traditional upfront chemotherapy. So, we, so it's no longer reserved as a last last uh, ditch effort, but now we are combining the use of these agents earlier and earlier and, and to see if we can actually see, you know, synergistic effect. And that, that as we go forward with these kind of approaches, eventually we have to start thinking about, you know, are there any chemotherapeutics that we give up front that can be peeled back a little bit to actually preserve uh, or, or to lessen the potential side effects. And, you know, as long as we can, you know, uh, maintain the overall uh, good outcome with, with the addition of immunotherapeutics. So, so there are a lot of clinical trials that we need to, to do as a community to really wrestle with this, you know, the timing and, and when do we pull the trigger and, and, you know, under what circumstances and how do you work it all together into a protocol. Uh, one, of, one of the factors that I think would ultimately influence whether or not an, an immunotherapy moves to frontline, even if it's it, even if it achieves the same uh, success rate in treatment with patients with conventional therapy, other factors include quality of life and side effects. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about side effects. Um, there's been some recent uh, press attention on um, the f that basically points out that you know when you're when you're working with something as powerful as our own immune system, um, things can go wrong, and that we are still learning. Um, how to manage those, look out for those um, side effects, and uh, treat them so that they don't become life-threatening. Uh, what are the side effects that are commonly seen when treating patients with immuno, uh, childhood patients with immunotherapy? Yeah, so it, it depends on what um, the agent is, and and depends on the the specific profile. So, so for example, in in what I mentioned, uh, the antibody therapy for neuroblastoma. Um, the, the, the GD2 molecule that's expressed on the neuroblastoma cells for which the, the antibody recognizes are also expressed in some normal tissue, uh, such as in, in, in neurons, right? So, you know, so we, we see uh, toxicities uh, associated with the, the, the nonspecific nature of these targets. Now, a lot of other immunotherapeutic side effects we see are the ones that are associated with, for example, cytokine storm, um, things that are related to the release of these very powerful proteins that the immune cells are very good at delivering, and that, that's why they, they kill the tumor cells. 
But by doing so, they also can damage the vessels and, and, and causing leaky blood vessels and, and other problems. So, you know, I think that the, the aspect of the side effect profile um, in some overlaps with what our experiences are in the adults. Um, and and the, the one good thing about uh, pediatric populations is actually the, our patients are very, very hardy. Um, and that's one of the reasons we are actually very successful in, in treating patients with multi-agent chemotherapy because our patients, unlike you and me, Brian, uh, can take it uh, better <laughs> uh, when, when uh, more tox toxic drugs are given and their, their tissue regenerative power is a lot better than ours. And so, you know, uh, you know we, there's actually ample reason to believe that our patients can benefit from, from some, if not all, the immunotherapeutic uh, uh, trial approaches. But again, it takes a, an expert, um, you know, both the physicians and nurses to be able to, to recognize the side effects, to intervene uh, in a timely manner, um, and, and do it in a safe uh, environment uh, in an academic institution. Um, and so, you know, and as our experience uh, extends more and more, I think that we can then do a better job at training our uh, incoming uh, doctors in this field to, to recognize the problem and to be able to manage them. I think uh, uh, just a, you know earlier in one of your responses, you brought up the concept of combination approaches and kind of marrying the best of both worlds. How can you take a chemotherapeutic agent, for example, that's uh, been highly successful in treating patients but may have a, a high side effect both short-term and long-term. Uh, long-term side effects are certainly a, a concern that's uh, not unique, but certainly center um, of thought when, de when treating young patients. Um, the, um, the idea of combinations, is that, is that complicated for parents to understand, or are they already, do they, do they get it? Because, uh, you know, combinations began with chemotherapies. There, there many chemotherapies are combined Right. Um, how foreign a concept is that? No, I think, I think uh, especially in pediatric cancer, I think that the concept of combining drugs that work uh, one at a time and work better when they're combined together, I think that's, that's not a foreign concept to many of our patients. Uh, in fact, you know, if you ask a three-year-old who's going through uh, leukemia uh, therapy uh, for two and a half, three years, uh, Johnny can tell you that on Friday I have to take this and um, every day I have to take 6MP, I have to take different drugs and, and I think um, and, and in general I think the pediatric pediatricians and pediatric oncologists do a very good job in communicating to the family the reasons behind the combination chemotherapy and the importance of doing such to to uh, manage potential emergence of resistance um, and so you know I think I think it's not a hard concept the harder concept will be for for a physician and a scientist to figure out when is a rational time to introduce a certain aspect of immunotherapy and when is the, the time to introduce chemotherapy so we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. As, and as you know, a lot of chemotherapeutic agents um, can not just target our tumor cells, but also can potentially target our uh, immune cells. So, you know, you don't want to put immune cells in there and then give an a, a agent that, that wipe them out all at the same time. So we've got to be smart about doing that. Um, we, you've talked about a number of, of uh, cancers that affect children, and each of them, um, you know, there, there's been varying degrees of success. Um, which, which, just to remind folks, which would you say are the ones that tend to be the most responsive to uh, any of the forms of immunotherapy that you described? And then which are, you know, on the near horizon in terms of uh, are we really cracking that yeah that nut so we can make, make immunotherapy effective in those patients. Yeah, so obviously the, the, uh, the most sort of widely um, discussed uh, approach is the CAR T-cell approach, which I mentioned before, and that's specifically against a specific type of uh, leukemia, B-cell leukemias and lymphoma. Um, and, you know, our success in that regard has been wildly successful. Um, and then there are other, for example, neuroblastoma, which is a very common solid tumors in, in the first decade of life, um, because we are able to develop the antibody that recognize specifically that tumor that's been very, very successful. And so um, these are the, the kinds of uh, diseases right now in pediatric space that is um, 
pretty well accepted as a, as a, um, as a therapeutic modality we can go to. Um, the emerging ones are what I mentioned earlier about oncolytic viruses and, and some other sort of immune stimulatory uh, approaches in brain tumor. Um, there's been some excitements about that recently, both in dendritic cell brain tumor uh, vaccines or oncolytic viruses, uh, different types of viral, uh, viral particle um, uh, formulations. So those are sort of developing. And what we are lacking right now is in sarcomas. Okay, so, so solid tumors, like rhabdomyosarcoma, Ewing's, osteo. Um, and the patients, um, you know, A, for the most part, difficult to find a target that you can develop a CAR T cell against. And even if you have a CAR T cell, they, when they traffic to these bulky tumors, their behavior is very different than their behavior in leukemia. So we need to understand a little bit more about the tumor microenvironment. Um, and, and how to regulate and get a handle on that. Um, so solid tumor is still a, a problematic area to, to address in, in pediatrics. Um, so on one hand, you've got CAR T cells and neuroblastomas that we, you know, we're very happy about the ongoing efforts, and then the emerging ones about oncolytic viruses and, um, and, and potentially checkpoint blockades in some of these diseases and brain tumors and others. And then, and then sort of the more uh, the sarcomas that we still when you have metastatic disease in sarcomas, the outcome still is pretty bad. Um, and I would also add in AML, um, despite our, our efforts in, in B cell leukemias and ALLs, the AML space still has room to grow. And, uh, and some of our antibody approaches to AML have not been as you know, uh, wildly successful as we have seen in other diseases. So I think there's some, some room to, to improve still. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you go into uh, predictions, but um, how close are we, do you think, to uh, an FDA approval for uh, pediatric immunotherapy? Well, so the antibody itself is approved, right? So the 14 antibody that that is, um, you know, one one of the one of the challenges we face as a pediatric oncologist is that we're dealing with a total population. You know, the in, and the annual incidence of 15,000 cases is hard to entice. Uh, pharmaceutical companies to to dedicate a lot of uh, resources to develop a disease for which there's no market. Uh, but thanks to some regulations out there, um, uh, you know, there, there are, for example, the FDA's voucher program. That's the one that actually allows the development of the, uh, the neuroblastoma antibody by the company. And, uh, and to incentivize the company taking on a rare infant disease, there's incentive at the end of that for, for them to, to then uh, have the ability to for a second drug to get fast uh, review by the FDA. So there are a few things that are going on to entice um, the engagement of the pharmaceutical company. It rem remains to be seen when CAR T cell is going to get, uh, get you know, uh, its, its uh, approval. Um, you know, we're hopeful, uh, and, and, but uh, I think you know, we got to work through some of the problems that, that associate with this, this toxicity profiles and, and understand them a little better, um, you know, when, before that happens. But, uh, you know, maybe in the next three years, maybe, I, I don't know. But, you know, the pace, the pace by which we are, you know, some of these agents are going through the FDA approval process in the immunotherapeutic uh, space is, you know, gives us hope, right? There, there are going to be things uh, coming on, on the horizon very quickly. So, uh you know, a cancer diagnosis is always, you know, a scary thing. Uh, when it's your own child, um, that's even, you know, scarier. And I, my question to you is, how do you earn the trust of uh, parents? Um, because it's a, it's a tough decision. How, how, how a parent decides. Um, which treatment to give or not give to to the child? That, that's a lot on 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 someone's shoulder. So how how do you and they place a lot of trust in their medical team? How, what do you do to help um, foster that trust? Well, I think you know I think first approach is you're always trying to be honest, give them an honest assessment about the situation. Um, you know you tell parents when you know something and you say I don't know when you don't know something. Um, you know, the trust is, it, you don't demand it just because you put on a white coat. Um, you know, it's, it's a developed relationship. We, and uh, in pediatrics, uh, we, it's not uncommon 
when we have a, a newly diagnosed patient with their family in the emergency room, that first night we spend two, three, four hours talking to the patient. There's no 15 minute time clock we have to, to punch. I mean, we, we sit there until all the questions are answered. Um, we, we take our time. Sometimes, you know, on the, the heel of the moment and the shock of the initial diagnosis, they don't, they, they can't hear anything beyond the first word that you say your child has cancer. So it, it is an ongoing process. We go back and revisit the issue. We make sure we they understand what the diagnosis was, what's the implication. And and we try very hard to to, um, to learn about the family dynamics. You know, be, besides the child, you know, does Johnny have a sister or brother and how old they are and blah, blah, blah. You know, what's their relationship with each other? And to pay attention, not just to the patient, but also to the rest of the family members. And in doing that, you know, we become not just a pediatric oncologist, but you're also their family doctor. And, um, and that trust is earned through those discussions. And sometimes when a disease is not going well, you have to be honest you know, and you don't want to create a false hope, um, but you need to give them a fair assessment of what's going to happen or what you think is going on. And then at this, the last, time, last thing is that you don't rely just on your own sort of judgment. And as I said earlier, you know, because we, we recognize the preciousness of each child's life, um, you know, none of the discussions we or decisions we make is made in, in solitude. We, we discuss with our, our colleagues, not just in our institution, but through, uh, like, for example, children, Children's Oncology Group and, and, and our networks around the country. Uh, we talk to each other at different institutions. So it's not uncommon that we hear about somebody's child in a different state, but we know intimately what's going on because we, we have that open communication among the physicians and, and, uh, and the nurses. So it, it does, right. it does it, it's difficult, but, uh, and it's something not, not everybody, no one wants to hear about, you know, your child has cancer, but uh, hopefully with, with advances in immunotherapy, you know, next time when I say your child has cancer, I can follow you up by saying, oh, we have a cure for you, or we have, we have, a, we have a plan. And this is this is gonna we're gonna get through this together, and uh, and and ultimately you know we have to earn the trust of a family and work as a team to come up with the best approach that is the best for for the patient and the family, um, and um, that's what we do. Well, uh, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, unfortunately, we can't get to all the questions. This was very enlightening. Um, it's certainly a a frontier that's uh, even even if the numbers of patients afflicted with cancer um, is not as high as other types of cancer, um, uh, childhood cancers, it's uh, it's still very good to see that there's people like you out there um, who have been working on this pro pro problem for many years, and that uh, there are collaborations of, of experts all around the world that are working together to help advance uh, new treatments for uh, pediatric cancer patients. So thank you. For doing that. Um, I also uh, can't end today's webinar without saying how cool it was to see the Death Star analogy in your presentation. Um, I, I think that's a good. Do you actually use that one when talking to parents? I, I, yeah, and sometimes even talking to uh, to medical students and residents, they need a little reminder of what the immune checkpoint is. So, mm -hmm. well, I will definitely be. Uh, <laughs> Thinking about that when I see the next movie that's that's coming out. So, anyway, so to wrap up, uh, just once more, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors. Cancer Immunotherapy and You Webinar Series is made possible with very generous support from Genentech, as well as Lab Answer and its employees, um, along with additional support from the following. Thank you all very much uh, for making this webinar series possible and helping us get this important information out to the public. If you'd like to learn more about cancer immunotherapy, uh, we urge you to visit our online resource uh, created especially for patients and caregivers. Um, the website address is theanswertocancer.org, and we've got a lot of uh, stories about patients who've been treated with uh, immunotherapy. Not too many um, pediatric, and in fact, I, I don't think there are any pediatric stories on there just yet. Um, as Dr. Huang uh, pointed out, uh, this is, uh, this is relatively new in terms of um, you know, where immunotherapy is. Much of the work has been done in adults, so we certainly will make an effort to find more stories like Emma Whitehead's um, uh, patients who've been treated with immunotherapy and 
uh, also to discuss with the parents about uh, the concerns and issues that that they want to deal that they're dealing with as they're bringing their their child through this cancer treatment so the answer to cancer.org also um, we mentioned that many of these uh, or these drugs are available only in clinical trials currently we have a clinical trial finder service that will help you locate a trial for your child um, and uh, please uh, visit our website to avail yourself of that free service as well. And finally, this webinar, as I said, it has been recorded and will be made available on our website at cancerresearch.org forward slash webinars. You can also browse our entire library of past webinars. Um, there are some really good, good basic ones on uh, Immunotherapy 101 if you want to get a little more in depth on the different things that Dr. Wong described in terms of the what we call the mechanisms of action, the way these immunotherapies work in the body. Um, we've got those. And then, of course, if you have interest in specific types of cancer, um, including many pediatric cancers, uh, we have webinars available on those as well. So with that, uh, thank you again, Dr. Huang. Thank all of you for watching. And on behalf of everyone at the Cancer Research Institute, we wish you a very happy and healthy holiday season. See you in 2017.